Katie Bickle and I will go through a few things with you this morning on, on creating a clear plan for, for the future of your business and what it's like to retire and some of the issues that we, we frequently come across when we're working with clients on this topic. So as an agenda for today, we're going to go through a few things about an introduction to wealth planning and some of the topics we commonly see for business owners. But we're also going to spend a fair amount of time going through uh, a little bit of a case study. You know, wealth planning is a term that can be used pretty broadly, and sometimes it's hard to explain necessarily the value we're bringing to our business owners without just sort of showing you how we do our work. So what we'll do is use a totally fake made up client and walk through some of the ways in which we learn a little bit about those clients needs, how we develop some strategies, and also how we go to the client to discuss those strategies and help them inform uh, the decision making process. I'm Paul Junick. I'm a wealth planner here in our Minneapolis office. Uh, I've got Katie Bickle, who's another wealth planner with us from our Fargo office today. Katie is a uh, graduate from the University of North Dakota Law School, and she's a certified trust and financial advisor. And she works in our wealth and transition services team, uh, which means that she spends a fair amount of time working with clients, uh, understanding their estate planning needs, uh, working with them on their estate-related and gift-related tax documents, and doing strategic planning around helping to make estate transfers and gift transfers more tax efficient. Hello everyone, I am Katie Bickle, as Paul mentioned. Paul is a graduate from the University of Minnesota Law School. He is a certified financial planner and works in our Ide Bailey Financial Services Group in the Minneapolis office. And within Ide Bailey Financial Services, Paul helps clients with investments, insurance, and also looking at that financial planning to help those retire. Thank you, Katie. There's, um, there's a, a lot of different people who fit into the financial services world. And I think sometimes it's helpful to understand where we came from in order to understand how we approach the financial planning process. So Katie, how, how did you get into sort of wealth planning and, and what are the things that really drive you when you're working with a, helping a client? Sure. So I have had the luxury in my career of working with clients through the whole estate planning process. I started as an attorney actually drafting wills and trusts and additional estate planning documents for clients. So I saw that process take place and worked with clients on that end. And then I also worked in the estate settlement area. So I was able to settle estates, work with documents that had already con come to completion, and at that point, settled the estate per those documents. And as a wealth planner now, I have the opportunity to discuss important retirement and legacy goals with clients. And retirement can certainly be a stressful and overwhelming time for people. And the decisions that can need to be made and are made at that time, I can feel very chaotic. And what motivates me as a wealth planner is to be able to relieve those stressors for people and get involved in that decision-making process and help clients feel comfortable and confident that they can enjoy what they've worked so hard to build over their working lifetime. So that's what motivates me and how I got here. How about you? Uh, well, I, despite also being an attorney, I came at the planning process from a little bit of a different angle. I started my career uh, actually working in individual bankruptcy law. Uh, and when you file for bankruptcy, you essentially have to put together a, a list of all of your assets and also do a, uh, a budget. Uh, you can't file for individual bankruptcy unless you can show to the court that you're actively losing money. And one of the things I quickly discovered was that there are these terms that applied to a lot of people like IRA or pension or annuity that everybody seemed to have. But despite all of my education, I really didn't know what those things were. And so I moved into planning primarily to say, well, rather than getting to a point of bankruptcy, I'd rather help where you're, you're already underwater. Um, I wanted to help clients sort of uh, plan for a better future. And so I've... Uh, been working as a, as a financial advisor now uh, for a little while and have uh, had the opportunity to work in, uh, with Katie's group a lot in the Wealth and Transition Services team and have been able to balance uh, the planning piece with the state planning and the investment portion of, of my investment management background uh, in a way that I really try to uh, look at clients to, in a way to help them get to a, a place of financial independence where um, they're able to either walk away from a business or retire from a job uh, and able to be able to just enjoy their life without worrying about finances. At this point, what I'd like to do is uh, move along to some of the 
some of the things that we talk about with, with financial planning. And as we've talked through what motivates us, we've talked through that retirement looks very different and is approached very differently by everyone. No two paths are alike. But when Paul and I talk to clients, we generally see clients' retirement concerns center around a few common questions. And that first question is, what do I have? And we want to understand the personal financial picture for each client. We want to know the value of their business, the real estate investments, et cetera. So we want to have that whole financial picture along with their liabilities. That second question is, what do I need? So we want to help clients understand in our role as wealth planners, we want those clients to determine what that retirement picture looks like and if they have enough to sustain what that lifestyle looks like. And then finally, how do I get there? which is obviously the most important piece, to identify what they have, identify what they need, but then how do we get to that point where they are going to feel comfortable? So that's that final step. We want you to feel confident and comfortable with that path. And again, every client's path is different. So as Katie said, each client is gonna have a different path to get to where they need to go. But we start with five basic components of, a, of a, any wealth plan. Uh, and this is really the components of, a, of your own personal financial situation. Um, the first is, your, is sort of your taxes, income taxes, understanding how uh, your tax burden will inc- impact your uh, financial future, um, both, both with regard to your investments or your business or your, uh, or your job. Secondly is the investments, and in many ways investments can be uh, a, a topic for its own discussion, uh, but for our planning purposes, investments are really a, a something that you need as a tool to get you to the planning goals. So it's a critical piece uh, that we won't go into very much depth today, uh, but absolutely sits in, in a, a key component of a wealth plan. Insurance and protection is about making sure that if you uh, have unexpected uh, disability or death or long-term care needs, uh, what are your options to fill those, those needs? And sometimes they're insurance, sometimes they're not. So it's really about understanding those gaps in the protection piece. Understanding your estate, how things flow if you uh, were to die either soon or, or down the line, making sure that uh, all the work that you've done, if you wanna leave certain things for your children, uh, or for people who aren't um, your children, what what are what are your options there, and what does that look like? And of course, the last piece is retirement. What does it look like to someday no longer have to work, to no longer have to earn a living, and how do we get there? So the first major piece of uh, a wealth plan, and one that we obviously talk a lot about, is being uh, when we're uh, part of a tax firm like Ide Bailey, is is the tax component. And I really break the tax planning into, into three levels. Uh, the first level, which people think about all the time, is, well, how do I avoid my taxes today, right? So we think about deductions. We think about uh, making sure you're taking the most on your, on your tax, uh, tax returns for things like um, uh, income deferral strategies, like saving into retirement accounts, um, deduction management timing those charitable expenses. And that, and that game has changed a little bit with, with the changes in the tax code. Now that the standard exemption is higher, uh, there are fewer people who are going to be taking uh, itemized exemptions. So how do we work with clients to understand how that impacts their plan? Well, on the business side, reducing your taxes today has a, a whole nother uh, set of decisions to be made. Uh, part of the uh, construction management piece that is a big portion of it is understanding expense management. For companies that have lots of equipment needs and a lot of costs to run those businesses, understanding the differences between expenses and depreciating assets is a, is a big uh, topic of conversation. But uh, even at the business level, there are income deferral strategies where uh, portions of the, the company's profits can be saved into retirement accounts. The second level of looking at uh, your taxes is not just to look at today, but what happens in the future. So if you invest in something like a a pre-tax 401k or a Roth IRA, how does that impact your taxes in the future? Are there ways in which we can, even if we're not reducing your taxes today, look at what your future expected taxes are and reduce your taxes in the future? 
And the sort of third level of the tax evaluation is looking at your whole lifetime. And sometimes that can be a real challenge when you say, you know what, even though I may have to pay more taxes today, I think my tax rate today is lower than it's going to be when I retire. And therefore, I might want to take certain amounts of income today. Uh, we see that happen uh, very often with clients who are in the process of retiring, where after they've stopped making, uh, stopped earning income either through their business or through um, a, a, a job that they've got, they may go through a period of time where their income is very low. They haven't started taking money out of, a, out of an account yet, or they haven't uh, started taking Social Security yet, and so they effectively have very little income. That may be a time in which you sort of elect to take income now rather than later. Um, so those are the three levels of tax planning that we go through with each client. Another component of wealth planning is the investment piece. And as Paul mentioned earlier, this isn't a presentation about selecting the right investment, but it is about understanding how considerations of your investment strategies make a big difference in the outcome of a plan. So we want to always invest through the lens of a plan when we're looking at wealth planning as a whole. So before you get to the stage of thinking about what to invest in, there are considerations we know that will impact the plan regardless of what happens in the market. So definitely taxes, what kind of accounts you're using matter as far as taxes are concerned. Also understanding how the fees differ between all the different forms of investments that you're currently invested in, such as account fees, expense ratios charged by mutual funds and ETFs, insurance costs within a permanent insurance account, things of that nature. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at the fees and the more you pay in fees, the fewer, fewer dollars you get back, right? So we wanna make sure that the fees you pay are worth it. And then flexibility. Are there limitations on when you can change your investments or get out of them entirely? And are there ways you can make the changes to the investments while avoiding those penalties of potentially liquidating early? Above all else, we want to invest and liquidate with purpose. So investing with a purpose in mind. What are these funds going to be used for according to the plan that we work through? We wanna look at the full picture. We also want to liquidate with a purpose. How do we plan to use those proceeds from the investment liquidation? We always want to have a plan in mind and look towards the future when we're investing as well as look as liquidating. And one of the things I would add to this too, as we've gone through it, is that all of those topics of conversation around taxes, fees, and flexibility, which apply to traditional investment vehicles, also apply to decisions you make as a business owner on whether to expand your business and how. You know, thing, if you compare the, the difference between uh, purchasing equipment versus purchasing real estate, uh, you know, the taxes are different for the two of those. There are different fees when you, and costs associated with running a business or running, uh, owning real estate versus uh, making sure equipment is, is running. And then there's flexibility too. Is it, you know, are you buying a very specialized piece of equipment that would be very hard to sell in the future, but, um, you know, we need it to run our business now. So those same topics of conversation come up, whether they're traditional um, market type investments or uh, business decisions that you're making. So as I mentioned earlier, we start with insurance conversations by starting by discussing uh, the particular need for insurance. And we do that by identifying, naming and quantifying the gap that exists within your plan. So uh, is there a gap that would be caused by premature death or disability? The easiest example to this would be if you have a husband and wife team uh, uh, and, and one spouse is the breadwinner, if that spouse dies early, what is that other spouse going to do for making sure that they can maintain the home, pay for the kids, and eventually retire themselves? So that's a clear gap. What would be needed to fill that gap? That's a planning question. The, the, the second part is about what what assets are currently available to fill that gap? So to, to use the example of the, um, the, the uh, person with a job and a spouse who doesn't work, if by the time they, that working spouse is on the edge of retirement, well, maybe they have a good pot of money saved up in things like a 401k or an investment account, where even if they pass away, there are enough assets for the spouse to live off of. And then the last part of that is identifying solutions. Let's say there really is a gap and they don't have anything to fill it with. What kind of policies are out there that make the most sense? 
And then once we identify those policies, is that cost really worth it? So some of the common needs and solutions that we work with a lot, income replacement, that's the example of one spouse working uh, and being the primary breadwinner. Term insurance is often a pretty good solution to that. It's low cost um, and uh, you, you don't need the coverage typically after the person stops working. Another big portion that we work with a lot is anticipated estate tax or liquidity need. If, you, if the vast majority of your net worth is owned in the business uh, and you pass away and you're, you have exposure to estate tax, you wouldn't want to have, have your spouse or your, your children have to sell a portion of your business just to pay your estate tax. So sometimes we can use life insurance as a way to fill that need. Another core component of a wealth plan is the estate. And the estate plan is an important piece of the puzzle when we're using a holistic approach to wealth planning. We want to start with who gets what or how assets are currently titled. So as a wealth planner, Paul and I will look at your best beneficiary designations. We'll look at who are the primary and contingent beneficiaries for life insurance policies and qualified accounts. And we'll also look at transfer on death and payable on death designations. But we also want to review the estate talk documents to determine if the current estate plan really fits with what your goals are. So not only do the titling of beneficiary designations and other assets, those go a long way in determining where your assets are going to go, but overall, what are your goals and what does your estate plan say? We want to make sure that you understand those documents. And if you don't have those current estate planning documents or if they're not current in that there has been some life changes since your last documents, we wanna make sure that you understand if you don't make any changes, where your current assets will go. Another part to the estate plan and what we do as wealth planners is we'll also review that estate plan, determine if there are any gaps, imbalances or liquidity needs. And sometimes those gaps are intentional. Sometimes clients leave children out of wills or have equalization or do not have equalization clauses in their documents. But sometimes those are unintentional. So we want to identify those gaps. Um, sometimes those gaps are due to change in circumstances. Sometimes they're because of the change in laws. So ultimately, we just want to make sure that we identify those, make sure the client understands that those gaps are there, and then address those if needed. Many clients, especially business owners, often do struggle with the fair versus equal um, classification. So what is fair may not always be equal. So we want to make sure that when we're transferring assets to beneficiaries that we're having that discussion with clients. If there are two children that are maybe involved in the business business and a third is not, how do we appropriately equalize that third child and what does that child what does that look like for the client? And again, fair is not always typically equal. So we want to make sure we're having those important discussions. We also work with clients whose net worth consists of a lot of illiquid assets, such as business owners, where all of the assets are tied up in the business or an illiquid, illiquid asset. So if there is a state tax liability, where ultimately is the estate going to get the cash to pay that tax? We want to understand also the client's succession and legacy goals to ensure that we have the appropriate tools in place at the appropriate time to pay tax or to equalize a beneficiary. So the final piece that we talk about uh, that, that sort of sits behind a lot of our decisions has to do with retirement. And I don't have a lot of information on this slide, primarily because retirement can differ so dramatically from one client to another. Um, I have some clients who basically tell me that they, uh, they can't wait to quit their job and they want to retire as soon as they financially can. And I have others who say they're, they're, you know, they're going to die at their desks. Um, so how, how we plan for those clients and how we either encourage savings or uh, what's sometimes fun is to encourage spending where we say, you know what, if you're going to work forever, um, you're just, you're, you're building a pot of money for, for something that you don't have a designated need for. Um, so we start by basically working hard with the client to define and over time redefine what it means to retire. Uh, I, I've worked with clients who in their, who in their 40s said that they, they thought they'd work forever and then by the time they reach their 50s, they, they've changed their mind, that they do want to stop at some point. 
Um, and uh, a plan is uh, about sort of reevaluating those, those decisions over time. But the core pieces that we talked about earlier are still there. What do you have for retirement? What, what are your options for retirement? And that can vary dramatically. Some people have a bunch of money set aside in 401ks. Some people have a bunch of money and time dedicated into their own business that's building value. How do I think about what I need for retirement? That depends a lot on how you have defined what retirement is. Um, and in order to uh, figure out how much you need, we, can, we have to start with knowing what, what, that, uh, what that retirement picture looks like and working backwards. And if you don't have enough money to retire, if you don't have the assets you need to do it today, which most of us do not while they're working, um, how do you get from from where you are today to where you need to be in order to walk away from your business. If most of your assets are in a business, what are the steps that you need to take to either make sure you're setting aside assets now outside of the business so that you can retire, or what are some of the decisions you can make now to make that business more valuable? If that's the decision that you're gonna be uh, faced with when you retire, selling or transitioning your business, you wanna make that business as valuable as possible. Katie, why don't you go through this slide a little bit and we'll I'll, I'll add in. Sure. So we do know that there are critical topics for the construction industry specifically. We have short and long-term tax planning. So with the construction industry, we know there are significant capital expenditures. There are expense deductions to think about the depreciable assets and buying new equipment. And also the depreciation recapture upon sale is an important component of this particular industry. We also look at the business valuation. So evalu valuations of the equipment. Is there a tax affected value? Value of outstanding contracts. Value of the name and the reputation and goodwill. We'll also look at succession planning. Who is qualified to take over your job? You know, we look at many different succession plans for different clients and whether that's a family member or a key employee, we want to look at the quality control and work product, your buy-sell agreements for that succession plan, and we want to make sure we review those to make sure we have the proper planning in place. And then, of course, your network connections and relationships are a true component and big component of that as well. Paul, anything to add? Yeah, so... Some of the clients that I've, I've worked with specifically in the construction industry have faced uh, uh, a few challenges on some of these topics. Um, in particular, uh, was, a, was a client I worked with who the primary value within the business was their equipment. Um, they owned uh, lots of iron, as they referred to it, which was um, all the tools that they needed to actually run their business. And so what, what had happened was they'd purchased uh, a number of these um, uh, you know, things like trucks and uh, loaders and things like that, that, that were then being depreciated over time. Now, even though that, um, uh, that depreciation is nice from, a, from an income tax standpoint, when those assets get sold, whether that's because the whole business is sold or if those assets are sold within the business, there's a term called depreciation recapture. It essentially says, we allowed you to take an income tax deduction when you, as you were depreciating them. Now, if you sell them for a gain, we're going to call that recapture ordinary income. That's much more expensive. That's much more at the higher rate than capital gains rate. So even though it looks like your basis has really declined in these, in these assets, um, sometimes you can still sell them for, for much more than what your basis is. And, that, and it's one of the few places where that uh, difference between what you sell it for and what your basis is is taxed at an ordinary tax rate. That made a big difference when it came to going down to the third box, or this, I'm sorry, the, the uh, second box, the, the value of that business. There was an argument to be made, well, I think the business is worth this. Well, yeah, but if I sell it, I have to pay a big tax bill. So understanding how those things work together is, is pretty critical to understanding uh, what a reasonable expectation is for how and when you sell your business. Um, and then the other piece that comes up with, with pretty much every business is this idea of making sure that if, it's, if this business is your baby, this is what you created, how do you keep that quality of work and that reputation strong as you transition or if you're, whether it's transitioning out to a third party buyer if, if it's your name on the business or if you're the one who created or really brought that business 
to, to uh, a successful point, you don't want to see that crumble. So how do you make sure that that quality control is in place? Um, and unfortunately, that's not something that often comes with a big dollar benefit, but we understand that that's an important piece of working with construction uh, companies in particular. Um, and then uh, another piece that often doesn't have a big dollar value to a seller, but is a critical piece of your own business, is understanding how things like relationships are critical to landing contracts. If you've been the person who's leading those relationships and you're landing contracts because you know who to talk to when a new uh, uh, job opportunity comes up, if you leave that business, that's a critical resource for that business that's no longer there. So understanding how that fits in is a, is a big part of a financial plan for the, for the business owner. So putting it all together, we've talked about the different components that may make up your specific wealth plan or wealth plans in general, but how do we at I'd Bailey approach the wealth planning process? So our first step is we want to build your team. We have a lot of knowledge, we're grateful for that. We have a lot of it at our fingertips and we want to ensure that we pull the right team together to deliver that appropriate expertise based on your specific needs and your specific goals. The second step is to build your plan. We will pull together that expertise through advisor recommendations and gather that information that's necessary to build your plan. And when we pull those two together, we can build that right plan for you. The third and probably the most important part, the most important is to implement those strategies. It's one thing to get through the build your team and get through the build your plan, but at the end of the day, if we're not executing on that plan, then we're failing you as, as your trusted advisor. So we wanna make sure that we are asking, whether that's asking your attorney to update your estate planning documents or retitle assets or look at, ask your CPA to look at the tax picture again and any gains that may be associated with a sale. We wanna make sure we're implementing those strategies. I would reiterate too that when we work in a, uh, on these wealth plans, they, they, they often take years to develop and years of a relationship. And you know, in the beginning when we start your strategies and we, we build your plan and we tell you what we need, what we expect, uh, how we expect to get you to where you need to go, um, all of that work is, is kind of meaningless if we don't actually help you implement it. We work with clients over time to get, the, to get moving in the direction they need to. When we were putting together this presentation, we started by putting together the, the details of what wealth planning is. Um, and we realized that because it's different for different clients all the time, it's very hard to sort of boil it down to here are some of the things that we do uh, for these clients. And there may be people in the audience who say, well, that's great, but I don't really need that. And so I think what we tried to do is say, let's, let's show how we actually do our work. Because the way we do our work uh, as a team, remember, we build, our, we build our team first, and then we build our plan. The idea is we work together with uh, things like your, if you've been, have a long-term relationship with your tax advisor, we work with your tax advisor, we work with your uh, attorney to, to make sure we understand your estate documents. Um, we work together as a team to try to find the right answers. And so this case study that we're gonna go through for Joe and Marie Johnson, again, totally fake clients, um, is, is going to be a little bit of a role play between myself and Katie. You'll hear the way our, our clients sort of come to us, You'll hear the way we get to learn a little bit about them. And then you'll even hear um, a little bit about how we come up with some of our strategic solutions. So I'm gonna jump right into it. First is the typical setup. Uh, Katie and Paul receive an email from a, from a made up tax partner here in our Minneapolis office named John Smith, who says, I have a client, maybe considering retirement soon. Uh, I met with him this spring to discuss his taxes, but he didn't seem as excited to work as he had been in previous years despite having a great year financially. He talked a lot about his grandkids who live in Arizona, and I think he'd like to see them more often. Uh, I know you help with investments and insurance stuff, but can you help him with these big picture type questions? So I respond, John, it sounds like your client may benefit from the wealth planning approach. Um, let's discuss and see what, see what you know about the client first. Uh, let's try to connect with, with the CPA. So next, John, Katie, and I, we all get together and we have a conversation. Uh, and as we're leaving the conversation, Katie and I connect a little bit to start talking about some of the things in, that we learned from, from John. So Katie, I, I heard from John that 
Uh, let's see, clients are about in the late 50s. I didn't get a, an exact date of birth, so we should make sure that we, we follow up with him on that later. Um, John uh, doesn't know uh, the spouse very well. It sounds like most of the time it's just the, the husband, the business owner who comes in and works with John on the, on the, uh, the details of their taxes. So, um, but we're, we're looking to do a plan for both of them. So we may need, may need to get her in, uh, into the meetings as well. I think her name was Marie. Um, also, did you hear that he said he's been working with, with, uh, with the business owner now for like 20, 25 years? That's a long time. Uh, we better make our, our planning pretty good for this guy. Yeah, and what I got from the meeting too is it seems like mom or Marie is is basically retired. Uh, it does sound like she does actively work part time if needed in the office. Um, also, there are the two sons. Bill is in the business, but Jim is not, which seemed to me to be an important piece of the puzzle for them as far as who could potentially take over the business. It seems like Bill is probably the front runner there, um, but they were, it was important for them to keep things fairly equal between the two. So we definitely want to think about how we can develop a strategy that that happens, but that Bill is able to potentially purchase the business. Yeah, and, and I noticed uh, some of the details from John. It sounds like he's got a pretty good uh, a, a little niche that he's working in, which sometimes can make a business tough to sell because you need to find somebody who's willing to work within that scope. But uh, it sounded like he thought he could sell the business if he needed to. Um, so I think one of the things we'll want to confirm is whether he wants to sell it to a, to a third party or if he, or if he wants uh, one of the boys, uh, I think it was, uh, Bill, yeah, Bill is in the business. We want to Bill to take over um, the business instead of Jim. Um, sounds like Jim is doing okay, but Jim's the one who's who's got the the grandkids down in Arizona. So um, so I, we should figure out exactly what the dynamic is between to between Bill and Jim as well, um, because if um, if something were to happen, they could end up being joint owners of the of the business, and I don't know how well they would work together. Uh, especially if that's going to be split evenly between the two of them. No, I agree. So as far as the cash flow, I assume that they were pretty cash flow neutral. Did you agree with that? Yeah, normally normally we would see some kind of big savings account or even just the, you know, the cash would be going up on the side and you'd see that in their tax documents, right? We either see uh, an, an investment statement or we'd see a savings account that's generating sig significant interest. And I didn't see anything like that. So um, let's assume that they're cash flow neutral. And by that, I, I guess we just mean they're, they're spending everything that they're making aside from what, exactly what they tell us they're saving. So things like 401k we can see, but everything else is just gonna be spent. And it might be important just to possibly increase their their spending in retirement. I know we've talked about talked a little bit about their budget and got a little bit of an idea, but most clients are looking at spending a little more in retirement, whether that's for travel or medical insurance, things of that nature. What do you think about that? Good point. Um, I think John mentioned that uh, uh, that that Joe visits uh, Joe heads down to Arizona for a convention that he likes to attend every year, and I think he puts that expense into the business, but he also while he's down there gets to see the grandkids. So if we think about that as an annual trip for him, uh, we should make sure that we're capturing that as an additional expense for him personally after he retires. Um, also the truck, right? I mean, he's got a, he's got a nice uh, new truck and you get to depreciate those so quickly that it makes so much sense to put those into the business. But if he's in the habit of driving, you know, a nice big truck every, uh, that's only a couple years old, uh, that's a pretty significant expense that we should make sure that we have covered in retirement as well. All right, so okay, we've got we've got the base facts down. We got some retirement. Uh, what what do you think their goals are? Like, what do you how how would we define those based on our conversation with John? Well, it sounds like Marie or Mom doesn't necessarily want to control the business if something should happen to Dad. That's what I got out of the discussion with John and and Marie's stance on the business. Um, it does sound like Bill could run the business with dad, um, but potentially we may want to look at Bill possibly buying out mom down the road. Maybe that's a strategy we, we look at. 
And then I know obviously we touched on whether it's an internal sale makes more sense than selling to a third party if Bill's in a position to take over the business. But could Bill take over right away? Does he need the extra cash or would he need cash to buy out uh, potentially Jim or mom if, the, if that, um, if need be? All right. It sounds like John, John doesn't know Bill all that well yet. I mean, if he's not trying to take over as the business owner there's no reason for him to know him yet so i think we'd have to go to go to joe and see what he thinks about whether or not uh bill would be able to take over the business in the short term um and i i also get the sense that jim you know working as an er nurse down in arizona he's not he's not gonna be of much help if something were to happen right i mean he's not he's not gonna be able to contribute and i don't think he's gonna want to contribute if uh, if Joe passes away and leaves it either split between mom and Bill uh, or just outright to Bill. Uh, so, so if that's the case, how do we make sure that thing is, that it's fair, right? If that Jim gets a portion of it, even though um, he's not going to run the business. Right. Well, I think, um, I think we've got enough background or at least we've gotten as much as we can from John. I think we need to go talk to the clients themselves uh, and sort of hear what they have to say. That sounds like a good idea. All right. So, so during the client meeting, we pick up a few interesting facts from, from, uh, from Joe and Marie. Joe said that the business is doing great, and so am I for now. That makes it sound like he, uh, he's feeling comfortable now, but maybe he wants to w walk away at some point while he's still f physically healthy. I know his work can be very physically demanding for him. Uh, Marie said she she does love it here uh, where she where they're living right now, but she feels far away from the grandkids. I'm getting that makes me think that really she's she's raring to go and and get down to Arizona more regularly. Um, he commented that Bill's a great employee that he really knows his stuff, but you know what if he doesn't want to do this forever? That was that was a good point that you know just because this was Bill's first job that he got out of college because it was pretty easy because he just went and worked for dad. Maybe he doesn't, we should also make sure that before we do anything permanent that we got to get Bill's input, you know, um, would he want to take over the business? And then clearly Marie still is worried a little bit about being unfair to Jim. Um, you know, she made the comment that they couldn't just give it to Bill. Uh, wouldn't that be unfair? So uh, kind of reiterated a few of the things that we were suspecting. Um, but definitely means that we got to find a good retirement option for, for dad in the short term. And uh, mom's clearly uh, eager to retire as well, but wanting to keep things fair. So the first step that we would do, I think, Katie, is we should, we should probably take a look at what they've got. Uh, let's start with their net worth statement. Um, so I put them into our into our software and generated this net worth statement. Uh, looks like we've got everything accounted for in terms of the values. Is there anything that jumps out at you? Well, I would definitely. It definitely looks like the the business has the most value compared to the rest of their assets, especially their retirement assets. And then also, in terms of Joe's estate versus Marie's estate, I mean the business is all in Joe's name, which could potentially be an issue down the road if we're looking at equalizing and whatnot. Yeah, that certainly raises a couple of my concerns. If we talked about, you know, equal and fairness, if we gave one kid the business and the other kid just the investments, that's a big split. So let's uh, let's take a look at that that balance sheet and just look at it in a different way. Boy, when you look at it this way and you see the value of their business relative to everything else, that's just a, you know, that looks like Pac-Man right there. Um, we got to figure out a way to, to balance that out in the long term. Um, that's a lot of exposure if he's got to think about what to do with that particular investment. So I think, I think we've, we've figured out about where they are today. They actually weren't then uh, uh, we figured out what the value of the business was, the value of the retirement assets, the value of the home. Um, I think we got a we, we got a good starting point, but we got to figure out where they're going. What do, what do things look like in the business? Uh, so here's their cash flow. Uh, the cash flow basically, you know, 
Uh, Katie, we're seeing their inflows and we've got their outflows. Expenses, remember within the expenses, that's their taxes. And then we got their planned savings, that's their 401k. Uh, looks, like, looks like we've got them to pretty much cash flow neutral, right? So, you know, they could call it 300 bucks in the first year, $634 in the second year. So they're, they're, not, they're not saving anything outside of what we've got designated. Um, but one of the things I noticed, Katie, is see this? And when, when he's 65, his business income just continues. Right. Uh, and is uh, is that necessarily the case? I mean, do we know for sure? Is that coming all from business income or what are those other inflows? Let's drill down into that a little bit. Okay. It looks like his other inflows are a portion. He's got, he's got a chunk of money coming in from the business, but he's also got a lot of money coming in from the real estate. So the real estate is generating a fair amount of money. I mean, he's renting to himself, but, it's good to know that you know uh, if we took the the company's um, uh, real estate and separated that out, that there's some good income there as well. So we could potentially, if we were working through a strategy, maybe we don't suppose the business income continues if he sells, but maybe we keep the real estate piece. Yeah, good point. All right, let's try modeling. Uh, uh, the sale of the business in a minute. All right, pulling question number two. So we're gonna do one and two back to back just to get those out of the way. But the second one here is in the example of Joe and Marie Johnson, would business income continue if Joe stops working? And the results for this one was 71% true and 29% false. I actually think that's a great response because it shows that in some businesses, your income can continue even when you've stopped working and in other businesses, it doesn't. So in our example, we're, we're saying that if he stops working, it's, he's going to stop getting business income. Okay. We'll go ahead and do um, polling question number one here. So polling question number one is now open on your screen. All right. We're going to close this poll and hear the results. All right. Okay. Well, we'll jump back into some of our, our work. Um, all right. Well, let's let's do this. Let's model that he sells the business when he hits 65. So that that gives him a little bit of time to keep working in the business. Uh, what what would that look like? I'm going to assume that there's a little bit of an upfront down payment, uh, but realistically, if he's selling it to his son, his son's not going to be able to just buy him out in one year. So we'll buy him out with future profits over 10 years. Let's see if that's doable from a retirement angle uh, standpoint. All right, we can see over on the graph here, looks like he's getting a fair amount of income coming off of that. And you know, notice this is just his portfolio asset, so his portfolio gets pretty big. Um, but let's, uh, let's confirm, let's go check back in with John and see if we've got the right numbers here on the, on the uh, basis and depreciation recapture. All right, well, after, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I can definitely see it showing up there in the total expenses with the additional tax since the basis is lower than we expected there's going to be more gain with the sale yeah so it's a, it's 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 double whammy there right we're going to have more ta capital gains and more depreciation recapture so that's that's stressing the plan a little bit uh let's make sure that he's still okay for retirement purposes well looks like even as he's spending from his uh his retirement account you can see it kind of go up and then start coming down that still looks to be plenty. He's got plenty of assets at the end of his life. So it looks like retirement is pretty good for him if he's able to sell the business for what he expects he can sell it for. But what if he can only sell it for, you know, two million instead of six million? What would what would that look like? Um, well, interestingly enough, when you look at his his uh, investments, his investments are still fine. I wonder why that is. We should go check his different income sources, and it looks like he's got he's got income sources from a number of places. He's still got his uh, rental real estate. He's got income from his 401k and he's got social security. So uh, that's covering a lot of their expenses. And that's good to know, even though we know that the business is probably worth around that 6 million, even taking it, taking a bit of a, a cut there at 2 million, it's still good. And will give them, I would think confidence to know that if things worse came to worse and we had to sell it for less, they, their picture still looks pretty good. Yeah, I think we should go back and make sure uh, they understand this. But I, I, I think he's probably aware of the fact that if he sells his, his business for what it, 
what he thinks he can get for it, he's going to be fine financially. Uh, the big thing t here would be a timing issue. You know, here we have him selling it when he's age 65. That only leaves him two years before he starts taking Social Security at full retirement age and only five years before he has to start taking money out of his 401k. So, I, I you know, talking to him about selling too early would be important. I agree. All right. Well, let's move on a little bit then to uh, um, uh, the estate balancing, because I think that's really what they were focused on a bit, too. According to the attorney that we talked to, the current structure, and, and this was confirmed by uh, Joe and Marie, everything transfers to the surviving spouse first. And then at the death of the second spouse, the business goes to Bill, and then everything else is split evenly. So I think they clearly said Bill gets the business. Uh, let's see how that looks. So initially, we can see what we brought up before when we're looking at the two boxes, Marie's estate and Joe's estate, obviously they're not in balance there because all of the business interest is with Joe. Right. But then we'll see that Marie then would inherit the business, which is that box, that 7.7 .7 million, mm -hmm. because then Bill would obviously get it at the death of Marie. But then at the bottom, it's interesting. So that total to heirs box, if we yeah. looked at that, how does that split out between the two sons? Let's check it out. Oh, well, wow. Everything is uh, very heavily favored towards Bill. And that makes sense if they were to die today at last death in 2019, because Bill gets the business and one half of everything else. Most of the values in the business and Jim and Sarah only get a little bit. Um, so, Maybe what we do is we just say, uh, let's leave everything, let's leave the bill, business to Bill, but then everything else just goes to Jim. We'll just try to balance it as much as we can that way. All right. Better than A before. little bit, but. Oh, and then if we send this out into the future, it, goes, it gets even worse in the other direction. Now, now Jim is getting everything. All right, so we're back to the drawing board, but I have an idea. What if we set up a buy-sell agreement? We'll split the business between mom and dad now, and then when dad dies, his one half goes to uh, uh, Bill, and then later on, uh, Bill can buy out mom's half interest, and uh, we'll, use, uh, we'll use life insurance to fund it. That, that, I think that's what we could do. So you know, that's good because you know, Bill would get to be in control if dad passes before mom, Jim would still get the value of his one half of the business if mom dies before dad. But with the life insurance, that gives Bill uh, enough in, in, uh, money to go buy out the other people and take eventual ownership of it. What do you think of that? Let's, let's see how that looks. All right, all right. So this is looking better. Now we've got their, their interests are, are split more evenly. Um, as of today, you can see you know, Bill takes ownership of, of half. So if they were both to die today, Bill takes ownership of half. Uh, let's see how that splits. Ah, much better. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Let's fast forward this into the future. Okay, now we have them dying at age 80. Um, things are still pretty well balanced. But in this case, because the business has already been sold, right? So the so the business has already been sold to Bill. Bill already has the business. Um, everything goes to Marie, and then Marie splits everything at her death. It's still pretty even. Yeah. Uh, that seemed like a pretty good solution. What do you think? I agree. That's definitely one way to look at it, but I think there's a lot of work that they would have to do on the front end to get those business interests split. I'm just thinking, is there an easier way we could go about this where there isn't so much work on the front end? And what I'm thinking about is maybe using a term policy. Now, of course, this is short term. Ideally, we would love Joe to stay around for as long as possible. But what if ha something happened to him? I don't think we're in a great place right now if something were to happen to Joe as far as Bill potentially having enough cash to purchase the business. So what if we used a term policy, put $5 million in the term policy, and had an irrevocable life insurance trust hold that policy and then Bill and Jim could be the beneficiaries of that trust and they each get half of the policy proceeds at dad's death 
Um, the business then would be split between the two kids, but then Bill has the cash from the policy to buy out Jim if he really wants to. And there's always the possibility that if dad does sell the business, we can stop paying on the term policy. Um, what I think is good about this is that, that we aren't retitling anything today. There's not an interruption in what their current structure of the business is and their succession plan. Um, there's minimal complexity here. Uh, we can stay in, it can stay in place now and in the future. And as far as the term policy, it, we can explain to them that at the end of the day, we were thinking about that anyway as an additional cost. Yeah. So for maybe this particular plan would be easier to, to put in place and we wouldn't have to worry about all the upfront work. So this really boils down to, as of right now, uh, you know, Bill would get roughly $5 million more than Jim. So if we just do a $5 million term policy and structure it right, I think that could work well. Uh, let's take a look at what it looks like now. So we still see the imbalance, but the, yes, then uh, the out of the estate, you see that $5 million from the irrevocable life insurance that would be outside of their estate, so it wouldn't be taxable to them. So mom has... Mom has 100% of her estate value now. Before, remember, we had to split the business, and so she only got half of the business value. Now she's got the full business value, and there's cash for Bill to buy her out if, if that's the goal. Right. And so how does that split look? Much more even. Let's look in the future. Still even, because everything is just split evenly down the road. Well, that, that seems like it could be a really good option as well. Maybe we need to go back to the client a little bit. Um, you want to go through some of the other issues we'll have to bring up with them? Sure. So we definitely want to talk through again, the buy sell, what that looks like, that structured buyout. Um, and then potentially Bill possibly buying out mom or Marie's interests down the road. And then of course, I think it all comes back to again, because of the two sons, what is the fairness of splitting those assets later? Um, should he, should Bill still get half of the estate if he's getting a hundred percent of the business? Well, if he's buying it, maybe potentially we, we should definitely talk through that. And then, you know, Joe's health obviously will play a big part in our insurance plan. If we're looking at that as a technique. Yeah. We'll have to check with, with them to see if Marie would be willing in any, in any way, shape or form to have to be the owner of the business, uh, as part of their plan. We could do that buy sell to avoid that although you know we don't plan on this ever actually happening right the, hopefully joe just lives long enough and uh it, it's not a big deal so that uh, we have to think also about how the fairness looks certainly if he sells the business to just one kid he's got to be doing it at fair market value not cutting him too much of a deal i guess the third polling question here what type of policy was listed out in the scenario for joe and marie well, we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up a little bit and say that's, that's uh, one of the ways in which we go through a particular topic. And that topic was brought to us as an, as an important piece from the client themselves. They said they wanted to really focus on being fair versus equal. They didn't necessarily come to us and say, do I have enough money to retire? Although we did want to address that. But there's still some issues that we will have to go through in this level of depth with them uh, when we meet again. And, and those, some of those just... Uh, to pull out a few are investment management, right? If they sell a business for a bunch of money, how do they, how do they manage those funds once, once they've been sold? Uh, and then income tax planning. Um, so if you're structuring a buyout, uh, is there a way that you can spread the taxes over the term of that buyout and making sure that those all, all uh, stay in place? So we'll be working with the CPA, working with the clients and finding out what makes the most sense for those. And where I would leave it is to say, when we do our, our plans, we provide ideas, research, education, and guidance. But everything is still up to the business owners and the client to determine the best route for themselves, their family, and their business. All right, last polling question here. What is stage four? All right, go ahead there. All right. Uh, so that, that's, um, I think we're just on to our questions here. We have a disclosure statement as I am a registered financial advisor, but if there are any questions, please feel free to uh, write them into the, the Q&A section now. Um, here are our contact information. Uh, you're welcome to follow up with us on, on any topics or if there's anything you'd like to discuss further.
There's no questions in the chat feature in the Q&A right now, so. Well, thank you everybody for, for attending and uh, uh, enjoy your spring and hopefully uh, we'll be keeping, a, keeping a, uh, an eye out for your CPAs who are working very hard to get through tax season right now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys. Have a great day.